Good morning and welcome to CSIS. I'm Steve Johnson, the director of the Americas program, and uh, it's uh, my distinct pleasure uh, to welcome you this morning uh, to a, an extraordinary event. We have a, a singular personality with us today, a truly great American, and I mean that not in the sense of North American or U.S. citizen, but in the sense of uh, hemispheric citizen in, in terms of the Americas, somebody who has fought for human rights and democracy and helped bring uh, moderate democratic uh, government, a government that is exemplary in, in many different ways uh, to all of us uh, uh, throughout the globe, uh, Ricardo Lagos, former president of uh, Chile. I'm not going to go too much into detail into uh, his history and uh, uh, the book that uh, we have, which is also for sale, I might mention, for $29. Uh, and for those of you who brought copies of your book, you'll be able to uh, have an opportunity to have uh, President Lagos sign, sign the book after uh, uh, our discussion this morning. But uh, I'm going to turn that over to uh, Ambassador Craig Kelly, uh, who's, uh, who was actually serving in Chile at the time that uh, President Lagos was uh, in office. Before I do that, I would just have a couple of uh, administrative uh, requests from you. If you could, please turn your cell phones uh, off or at least to uh, stun mode uh, so that we don't have any ringing throughout the, the presentation. And also during the question and answer, would ask you to, uh, if you have a question, to please uh, identify yourself, who you, uh, what organization you represent, and keep your questions or commentaries fairly brief so we can have a, a good uh, wide-ranging dialogue with uh, all of you here today. And uh, without uh, any further uh, remarks on my part, I'd like to introduce uh, Craig Kelly. Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to introduce President Lagos today, just as it was a great honor to serve in Chile as U.S. Ambassador during part of his tenure. Uh, a, a quick glance at uh, President Lagos's career is, is exhausting, uh, but I'm going to do so very, very briefly, knowing that my main duty is actually to leave the podium. Uh, but it, President Lagos uh, was, was a brilliant student in Chile, then came to the United States, uh, got his PhD at Duke, uh, taught at the University of North Carolina. I don't know how he resolves this at Mad March Madness time, but uh, that's uh, uh, his problem. Uh, then went back uh, in various uh, teaching and administrative capacities at the prestigious University of Chile. Uh, when after the after Chile's September 11th, September 11th, 1973, the coup in Chile, uh, he uh, left uh, the country. Was in Argentina. Was in the United States. Spent about four years outside of Chile, but then went back and worked with various UN agencies, but, but assumed leadership uh, of the pro-democracy movement in Chile and became uh, famous around the world for his courage uh, and for his articulate uh, expression of the need for a return to, to democracy in his country. He became a president of Acción Democrática. Uh, he, he was imprisoned for a while. Um, and then became leader of the, uh, the, no, the so-called no campaign in the 1988 referendum uh, and was, uh, did an interview on television. In fact, I should have brought my copy. Excuse me. Uh, President Lagos was uh, a famous interview on Channel 13 in Chile uh, of the various uh, uh, pro-democracy and pro-government forces. And at one point during the interview, he famously looked into the camera, assuming that uh, General Pinochet was watching, pointed his finger at the camera and said, I speak for 15 years of silence. Uh, a very effective moment which galvanized the opposition campaign. And we all know the result, the you No know, Campaign won, which uh, led uh, eventually to the res restoration of democratic government in 1990. Now, if, if he had simply stopped there, uh, in his political career and return to academia, he would already have gone down in, as one of the most consequential figures in modern Chilean history. But he uh, did not stop there. Uh, and he uh, was minister, served as Minister of Education under uh, President Alwyn, the, the first uh, government under, uh, after, the, uh, after the Pinochet period, first democratic government. Uh, as Minister of Education, he uh, implemented a, a vision 
uh, which, uh, which laid out that a, a good part of uh, Chile's inequalities were related to inequalities in the educational system. And so we undertook various incentives to improve schools, something that was, remained very dear to his heart throughout his career as president and, and even today. Uh, in the next Chilean government under President Frey, he served as Minister of Public Works uh, and uh, implemented very innovative programs of, of private public partnerships involving concessions to build new roads, uh, new ports, and so forth in Chile. Anyone who's had the pleasure of traveling on Chile's excellent highways or visited its very efficient ports uh, has uh, President Lagos to, to thank for this. Again, these are projects which continued during his presidency. Um, and it, that presidency, which ran from 2000 to 2006, uh, was noted for uh, President Lagos' ability to combine uh, the, his deep, deep commitment to uh, greater equality, greater social inclusion in his country, uh, and, and including uh, innovative programs in, in health and housing, conditional cash transfer programs, the famous Chile Solidario program, uh, which involved conditional cash transfers and visits by social workers to the homes of the poor and so forth. But combining all this with the economic efficiency for which Chile is famous, uh, free trade agreements with the European Union, with the United States, and opening up to the world, the result we have today is a country which has uh, free trade agreements, something Ambassador Carl Hills knows very well, free trade agreements with more countries than anyone else in the world, 56 other countries Chile has some kind of free trade agreement with. Um, and then in foreign policy, bringing Chile to the world stage. When I first arrived in Chile, uh, President Lagos hosted the APEC Forum uh, and, and was very present uh, not only regionally but uh, on the world stage, something he has continued today as a global statesman with the UN, uh, as a leader of the so-called Club de Madrid, the former presidents. Um, in reading this wonderful book, and I encourage you to read it, uh, I just heard Ambassador Hill saying that she, it, was a, it was a great read. It really is one that's hard to put down once you start. Um, I, I'm reminded in reading the book of a couple of really key tenets in, in President Lagos' career. Um, one is his ability to forge a synthesis of ideas that some people might consider uh, incompatible. You, you're very hard to pigeonhole President Lagos. For instance, during the resistance, during the anti-Pinochet campaign, um, he knew that uh, apart from expressing moral fervor, the, the, the pro-democracy anti-Pinochet forces also had to show that they could run the country. They were going to be asked at some point uh, to take over the country, and they had to prove that they were able to do that. So you had to, rep you had to express not just what you were against, but what you were for. Likewise, once in power, uh, dealing with the human rights legacy of the Pinochet period. Uh, I, I always was marveled at how Chile managed to look openly at the past, and, and the book describes the various reports, the Reddick report, the Volokh report, and so forth, about the abuses of the past, without being held back, without being, without, uh, being paralyzed by the past, and everyone knows what Chile has done to move forward in, in recent years, and this owes a lot, I believe, to President Lagos' ability to, to see two ideas at once and put them together in, a, in an effective way. Um, similarly, with the economy, uh, all the programs for social justice, uh, along with the, the well-known economic reforms, in 1990, when democratic government returned, the poverty rate in Chile was 44 percent. Today, it's under 14 percent. Uh, so again, this synthesis of social justice, economic efficiency has been something that has made Chile famous around the world. Um, also, I remember President Lagos as someone who uh, had an extraordinary ability to deal with people of all political persuasions. Uh, I happened to be there when, when President Bush came down for APEC. It's, it's no secret that, that Chile and the United States had different views on the war in Iraq, and yet the personal relationship between them was warm. Uh, and, and this is described in the book, and it's a fascinating part of the book, uh, President Lagos's relation with leaders uh, uh, of the other side of the political spectrum around the world. Um, in concluding, I'd like to say that I think that our view of Chile today has a lot to do with this man. Um, because we, today when we think of Chile, we think of, well, the title of the book, The Southern Tiger, the efficient model economy and so forth. But for many people of, of, of my generation, when you thought of Chile 30, 40 years ago, you thought of an autocrat named Pinochet. And for a lot of people, he appeared as sort of the quintessential uh, Latin autocrat and there was an identification of somehow Chile with this form of government. But when President Lagos was in the 
pro-democracy movement in the 80s. He saw it as one of his fundamental tasks to show to people that this was an aberration in Chilean history, that Chile had an, an honored history of Republican democratic government, and that this period was an aberration, and that Chile had to return to those democratic roots. And I remember very fondly, uh, uh, I had wonderful conversations with President Lagos when he was in La Moneda, in the presidential palace, but when he retired from the presidency, I was still ambassador, and I remember uh, some very wonderful conversations, including a, a lunch at, at, at my residence, in which he talked uh, a lot about 19th century Chilean history, and it dawned on me how that history ins must have inspired him during the resistance, that, that Chile had this, this very uh, uh, honored past of, of participatory and representative government. So, um, the, uh, it, Mr. President, it's, uh, Winston Churchill was, was famous for once having said, uh, treat, history will treat me kindly because I intend to write it. Uh, I, I would say that history will treat you kindly because you shaped it. You shaped modern Chilean history, uh, and, and it, it's an honor uh, for all of us to be here with you to hear a little bit of, of your story, uh, and I just want to uh, welcome you once again to Washington. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Ambassador Kelly, for your kind words. Uh, whatever he says, you have to divide by at least 50 percent because he's very close friend of mine. But uh, and thank you also for the invitation to to be able to to talk with you this morning about this uh, uh, book publication. Probably I should start saying what the book is not about. It's not a formally memoir, a, a long-standing memoir full of uh, footnotes and things like that. A friend of mine told me, I know what you're planning to do, to write a book. It's going to be about a three-volume book full of footnotes. And I guess that uh, one American student will read that book when he's writing a PhD dissertation comparing the taxation of Chile in the early 21st century vis-a-vis -vis Argentina. <laughs> and some other PhD student probably is going to do something similar in some other areas. But no more than three or four American people will read your very interesting memoir. So why don't you write something that people will read it, not very long, etc., etc. So I wrote this thinking in, in the general public and assuming that they know very little about a faraway country called Chile. Number two, I didn't know that it was very difficult to do this because, uh, let me tell you, the publishers, if you don't know, are really the ones that put the title to the book. I didn't like so much the title. And then when I finished the whole thing, they told me that uh, 100,000 100, words was the maximum and I have uh, 105,000. So they decided to cut it 5,000. Uh, the, the reason they told me is very simply because they are going to go to a bookstore and say, oh, what interesting is the book, you know? Chile, it's, it's, it's Chile is so far away, but I'm going to take it. And the next decision was, always they say to me, is to see how many pages. Oh, 300 something. Oh no, that's too much for Chile, <laughs> period. <laughs> Well, other saying that, what is it not about, it's true that to some extent the title that you have about the past, the present, and the future. What about the past? I would say that with regard to the past, I have a, a long-term problem with the past of Chile. That uh, when Chile celebrated uh, 100 years of independence in 1910, well, Chile was at the peak of the development at that time. And then 50 years later, an important economist wrote uh, Chile, a case of a frustrated development. And the issue is why Chile didn't make it. At that time, Chile has a per capita income very much like uh, Sweden. I don't need to tell what is the difference today. So that was one thing. And the second thing with regard to the past is the very recent past that we have with uh, about uh, 17 years of Pinochet's uh, dictatorship. And let me tell you that since uh, 1831, 
after a very short period of anarchy, right after the independence, we have had in Chile the rule of law. This is something that uh, somebody told me yesterday during 117 days. Other than that, always the rule of law was established in Chile. Democratic institutions fulfilled what they are supposed to do. There was, there was a long-standing democratic tradition, even in the so-called civil war in Chile. And therefore, it was rather unusual to have that kind of thing in our country. And therefore, recover democracy was the most important thing. And in the book, what I try to explain is, it's so difficult. How would you start trying to recover democracy when you have a very a strong government and where the rule of law is not respected, human rights violations, is uh, everyday life, etc., etc. And then the big issue was, how are you going to be able to form a coalition of parties that used to be adversaries in the democratic system and now they realize that to agree around some basic democratic and human rights institutions is essential. And therefore, no matter what your differences are going to be, you have to be together if you want to fulfill the idea of defeating a dictatorship. Number two, how are you going to do? And here then we have again a lot of discussions in Chile. Today, it looks back very easy. But the discussion was among those things that, look, the only way to defeat a dictatorship that is based on the power of the army is to defeat by violent means. And therefore, how I'm going to get arms, where, and how I'm going to train people. And we say, look, this is not the tradition of Chile. If we're going to defeat democracy, it's going to be through non-violent means. And it was a, a very strong discussion at the time. And I would say that the fact that there was an attempt against Pinochet, right after a discovery of a huge uh, amount of ammunition and arms being taken by, by Pinochet's uh, forces, this is what produced, I would say, in practical terms, the defeat of those that thought it was possible to, to go through violent means, the uprising or the struggle of the Chilean people. And for me, that was nonsense. If people was going to be afraid later just to sign for a political party that was a party of the opposition, according to the rules of the of Pinochet constitution, if they were afraid to do that, what about taking an arm to, to fight, you know? And what I try to explain is, is this discussion that we have. First, trying to make it, there's so many different factions of the Socialist Party and why we became the so-called the Swiss, because we are neutral with so many divisions, and we were only six people or seven people, no more than that. When we, I recollect the numbers of people that we were talking of these issues, it's ridiculous, really. And, and this is something that I mentioned in the book. And the other thing that I guess is important, yesterday somebody told me and said, you say very little about the U.S. involvement in the coup. And I say, look, I think that that is rather well known. But more important, I would say, the coup was the consequence that we were fighting among ourselves in Chile. That there was some help from the outside, there is no question. It's, we are talking about the period of the Cold War, that we are talking about when you are with me or against me, therefore it's black and white. But let's be clear, it was our fault why we lost democracy and it was our will to recover democracy by democratic means. And this is what we tried to, to do. And the other thing that I guess is important, but not as very well known, that the change of the American policy vis-a-vis -vis Chile took place during the Reagan administration and under Schultz as a Secretary of State. And uh, this is rather uh, unusual, I would say. But at some time, uh, American foreign policy understood that the future of Chile was in the hands of those that in the opposition were trying to fight 
by democratic means and nonviolent means. And I remember that uh, this, this I don't think is in the book. I, I remember once talking with President Bush, and he was rather surprised when somebody uh, told him that I had been in prison for a short period of time. And President Bush said, and what you did? Well, you know, there was an attempt against Pinochet, and they decided to put me on jail. Oh, so you were involved in that? No, I was not involved in that attempt against Pinochet. And then, why they took you to prison? Well, because that is the dictatorship about, you know? <laughs> And then I told him, but you see, the first person that went to see me when I was in prison was somebody from the American embassy on behalf of the ambassador. Oh, you, they did that? Yes, they did that. And I was, didn't know, I was told later that in a visit to the uh, State Department, President Bush mentioned this anecdote and say, I want that you remind that whenever somebody is in prison, then an American should go to see why is that. Because if he's fighting for democracy, then you have to be at his side. I say this because this is the way that, uh, well, I, then we, as you mentioned, we have some not very well understanding with regard to Iraq, but that's another story. <laughs> that is also mentioned in the book, by the way. Of course, I wrote, I wrote uh, the chapter about that, the usual way, for foreign policy. And those that were editing the book in a way that was a little bit more interesting, uh, one of them is the Beth here with, with, with me this morning, they say, don't you think that is a rather boring title? Why don't you push better Bush, Saddam, and me? And that's exactly the title of the chapter. <laughs> but uh, even though the agreement was that no footnotes are going to be on the book, that chapter has a footnote that is essential to understand what was really, uh, how important was uh, Chile uh, at that moment in the world stage. Because the footnote explained very clear that only by coincidence Chile became involved in those issues, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a funny story. Other than that, I would say that with regard to the pressure of Chile, it's true. There was 20 years of government from socialist and Christian Democrats and some other political forces in Chile. It's true. We were together in the transition to say no to Pinochet, which is quite easy. You just have to say no. It's a little bit more difficult when you realize that if you don't want to have in Chile a political vacuum, then you have to organize to run a government, which is a little bit more difficult than to just say no. And I think that what happened in those four years of uh, Elwin's administration is that we realize that it's one thing to go from transition from dictatorship to democracy, and it's another thing, much more difficult, trying to go from a very underdeveloped to a more developed country, to a rather, to a rather uh, backward, to a more modern, to be able to keep because your market is very small, opening trade with other parts of the world and you want to compete at the world stage, that is uh, difficult to tackle the issue of human rights violations, as uh, you mentioned, but we have to do it if we want to build with regard to the future. As I used to say in an address to the Chilean people, in order not to the repeat repeat again those violations, never deny that those violations occur in the past. In other words, truth is becoming essential and important to seal precisely the guns of the past. And therefore, I think that the decision to open up the country through free trade for us was essential. 
as part of our own development. And at the same time, the fact that if you had decided to go to competition in a globalized world, then the big issue is going to be what are going to be the rules of the game. And we know how important are the rules of the game, but we're going to establish the rules of the game. And this is the reason why when at the end, vis-a-vis -vis Iraq, and I tried to explain that in the book, this has to do with something very essential from the point of view of our point of view. Because we say, look, at that time we were at the Security Council and we say everything has to be taken within the Security Council. And if you ask me to go to war in a coalition of the willing outside the Security Council, I have to say no, because I'm undermining the multilateral institutions that are the institutions that are supposed to establish the rules of the game. And therefore, from our point of view, when you are in a small country, well, this question of how are you going to establish that rules and where is essential. And to some extent, if you see what's going on after 2008, or what is today in Europe, well, the discussion is about who is going to establish at the very end the rules of the game. Don't you think it's rather unusual that uh, those uh, agencies that are supposed to establish what is the risk of a particular country will tell you to the Minister of Finance what they have to do? Don't you think that it's the other way around? That citizens elect governments and the government are supposed to shape how a society is going to, to work? Even though I understand it's very important in today's financial market, I cannot believe that those financial markets at the end dictate what are the rules of the game. This is a very important issue in, in today's world. And, and therefore, I, I do believe that either because if you believe in free trade, then, well, the World Trade Organization is the way to discuss the major issues. When we were discussing the issues of anti-dumping with the United States, well, we agreed that uh, given our discussions, it was not going to be possible for us, little country, to ask the United States, why don't you change the rules of anti-dumping because we don't think they are very fair for us. And they say, well, I don't think that we are going to do that. You know, we didn't do that when we discussed with Mexico and Canada together. We are not going to do it for Chile. But then we agreed to say, why don't we take that at the World Stage, at the World Health Organization? And in the Doha Development Round, we put the issue of anti-dumping and we discussed at the multilateral level. This is what I think should be normally the case in this case and in others and among others. And therefore, the, the big issue is with regard to the present, I would say, one, we were able to have a transition, two transitions, and the second one means that we decided to keep our coalition together and never was a formal decision on that. It just happened that we have to keep together the coalition in order to fulfill that how are we going to be able to go to a more developed country. And I think that to some extent we succeed. With regard to the future, all of you are well aware of what happened last year in Chile, in 2011, about the students' uh, demonstration. But more than that, I could say, was not only a student, was some sort of a malaise in Chilean society. And how is that that this country that used to make uh, things very well that somebody write a, a book up with the title The Southern Tiger, now you have that kind of thing. And it's my impression that this is the consequence of the success of our story. Because we were able to reduce poverty, as you mentioned, from 40% to 13% in 20 years. But that means that that 27% of the population that leave poverty behind you 
Now they consider themselves some sort of uh, middle income classes. And they have a different kind of demands from Chilean society. If we are proud to have a seven out of 10 students in the university system, but at the same time, most of that has to be paid, not by government, by state taxes, but by private people. And if you have a, an income of, let's say, $2,000 uh, per month, and you have to pay a tuition, two, three, up to $400 per month, and if you have two at the university, well, you have problems, don't you think so? And therefore, what is going to be your demand? Don't you think that uh, Chilean society has to make a bigger effort so that everybody can afford going to college and if you don't have some kind of a scholarship are going to be, in order to make sure that opportunities in Chile are equal for everybody? Because once that your kid was able to go to the university finally, first time in, the, in, in that family, well, that's a, that's a different demand than when you are living under the poverty line. Number two, because you have this emerging middle class, well, society will need to address these issues in a different way. Because also this emerging middle class now is much more informed, much more empowered, there is something called internet. And therefore that means something quite different in the way that you understand and how you get informed. Now this is not only in Chile, of course. To what extent without internet it would be much more difficult to have the outer spring, the so-called outer spring. And to what extent, because of those Arab spring, then there is going to be something that you can call democracy 2.0? Because I would say that normally democracy up to now have been 1.0. In what sense? That after Gutenberg discovered the, the press, 200 years later or 250 years later, somebody decided, why don't we print some news every day? And that's the paper. And the Times in, in, in England, in the UK, and if you are going to print news that has to do with public affairs, then why don't we have, instead of the king, a democratic system? All of us know what's going on in the country. So we can say something about that. And some French philosopher on the other, across the, the channel, you know, decided that it's possible to have something like that, like Montesquieu, like Rousseau, et etc. Et all, all you don't know the history. And what was politics about? to have a leader, several leaders, to talk about public affairs, and people will listen. People will listen, and they vote. Now, it's true during those days, to vote, you have to have some property, and you have to be a male. Then things are touching a little. Then you have the radio, but again, now you can listen. But you are not supposed to answer to the leader that was talking on the radio. Then you have the TV, but you are not supposed to answer to the guy that was talking on TV. The big change is that for the first time, I like to say this, to go back to Athens Square. But in Athens, no, not the Athens of today, of course, no, no, that <laughs> Athens, the other Athens, you know. The other Athens, that Athens, you know, well, was no more than 150 males not slaves, of course, and they talked to each other in the square. All of them were political leaders at once, and all of them were able to talk to each other and to convince or not to convince. And today, with this new technological platform, you are back in the square, with the only difference that instead of 150 you have probably more than, in this country, more than 150 million <laughs> citizens being able to talk to each other. 
and you make a speech, you write a book, and as soon as you finish, you will receive a 200,000 tweets, you know, saying that you are such a stupid guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, and then they give you the reason why you are that, you know? I mean, it's a different way. Now, how politicians in the 21st century are going to be able to understand that they produce, they emit ideas, and they receive ideas from everybody? So I say, this is democracy 2.0. And are you going to have institutions built around this idea that we still have no idea? Because by definition, democracy is a system by which you elect those that are going to represent you in parliament. And you elect those that think like you, more conservatives, more liberals, more right-wing, more left-wing, whatever you want to call it. But if because of the democratic platform you decided when are you going to protest and then in order to protest you go to the square in Cairo, well, you can understand given the system, that they, the political system that they have. But don't you think that it's something different when one year later, in Italy, because the constitution of Italy established that there can be a plebiscite to abrogate a law established in parliament, and the citizens then, with a number of signatures, can call for a plebiscite. And they call a plebiscite. The plebiscite was about four laws approved by parliament to protect the prime minister of that time against some judicial problems, legal problems. The plebiscite to be able to be imposed over the will of the parliament and to abrogate the law required a number of people going to vote that day. Well, there was not a single political debate about the plebiscite in Italy. You can imagine why. But the fact is that because of the network, they won the plebiscite and they abrogate four laws approved by parliament. So, there you have a constitution that has an institution established in order that its citizens decided to organize, etc., etc. Big question. How is going to be our democracy and the theory of representation when you have this kind of thing? I'm not saying that everything will go to plebiscite. All I'm trying to say is, in the same way that because Gutenberg, the press, etc., etc., now you have a democratic system, how this democratic system is going to change, if ever, in this sense? Final point. I think that uh, in today's world, this question is going to be essential in order that our government and our institutions are legitimate. To what extent you are going to lose some legitimacy if you are unable to keep in track with these issues? And in our case in Chile, I think that what we are seeing now is a sense that to discuss about the future, not only political parties can participate, and political parties are not the only one that has enough legitimacy. And therefore, about our future, I would say, if we want not to repeat what happened 100 years ago, it's true. Now, given the economic crisis, we are performing rather well. This year, we are going to have a growth of about 5%. Uh, I mean, excuse me, last year. This year, 2012, is going to be around 4%, which is not bad. And now we have about uh, 15, 16,000 dollars per capita income. We are looking forward for when are we going to be in the threshold of the 20,000. 
And probably the big issue then is going to be more distribution of income rather than fighting poverty. And this makes a tremendous change. And therefore, the, the question for Chile, I would say, how are we going to be able to organize our society in the stage where we are now, which is different from the state that we were in 1990? And sometimes the major difficult for political leaders is to be able to agree in some idea of how the country is going to be organized. We agree to have a very open country from the point of view of trade. We agree at the end that it was necessary to look to the past in order not to repeat the mistakes in the future. We agree to have some sort of uh, political arrangement, but now I think that those agreements have to be overcome by different challenges, and the big issue is in order to have a bright future, better we address these real issues. Fortunately for us, are not only real issues for Chile. I think that the question of distribution is becoming a question not only in underdeveloped but also in the developed world. To have in this country a movement that is called the 99%, it sounds incredible for me. I, I think that it's so sophisticated to understand what that means 99%, you know. In this room everybody understands that, but it's, it's unusual. I guess that something has to do with the technological platform. And this is where I think that some of our best idea has to be more. In short, I, I tried to, to, to write a book thinking in, in these issues until what extent I, I wouldn't attempt to say what we did was something very new or very novel, not at all. Simply that sometimes it's necessary a little bit of common sense in politics. And I think that we try to employ our common sense in politics to have a broad coalition, to perform some things, and to understand that that, that was essential from the point of view of the country. And let me tell you, I wonder if I can say this here. Sometimes I perceive that this society that I get to know 50 years ago when I came to study, today is a much more polarized society, and I don't think that that's a good idea in terms of uh, a political scenario. And probably some kind of understanding what are the bridges between different political groups in a society, and to build bridges at the end is probably another aspect of a good political leader. And when you try to build bridges, then I guess the country may be better. Thank you. All right, now we'll uh, move to a, the conversation phase. Mr. President, thank you very much for those remarks. And listen to you, I'm reminded again of how you're able to, to pull things together. There was a phrase that President Lagos used to use when he was president of Chile when he referred to the need to open up the windows toward the past, but continue moving forward. He used to say, no hay mañana sin ayer. There was no tomorrow without yesterday. But yeah, and you have to do both, and Chile has done both. Um, if uh, anyone would like to ask a question, make a comment, please uh, identify yourself. And uh, please, sir, the yeah, microphone is coming. Uh, thank you. I'm Tom Reckford with the World Affairs Council. Um, Mr. President, you've talked a bit about uh, Chilean relations with the United States. I wonder, given your knowledge of the sweep of history, how would you characterize Chilean relations with Argentina over the years? Well, thank you, thank you for, for that question, because let me put it this way. Our relation with Argentina at the beginning, extremely good. We were together to fight for independence. In the, in the early 19th century. Then there was a time when most Latin American countries were in the process of uh, trying to make sure what is my identity as a country, what are my boundaries, what is the piece of land that I own. And then that was the period when we were discussing about frontiers and limits and so on and so forth. And I think that in the 20th century we were solved most of our problems. And because of that, then, we were able to see together what about the future. And I would say that in order to a more globalized world, are we going to be able to work with Argentina together? 
Are we going to be able to have some sort of integration, economic, physical integration? And we have had some advantages, important advances, like a, a, a different uh, uh, attempts to have a better integration, like a, a gas dock that we were built. And I would say that in the case of uh, today, we have a good relation with Argentina, uh, even though they have had some problems. But at the same time, I think that the big issue is that Argentina is a much richer country than Chile in terms of natural resources and, and natural endowments. They have three meters of a very nice land. They can produce two or three crops of wheat every year. We only have one because we only have less than one meter of uh, very good soil. So those differences will exist. Nevertheless, I think that uh, Argentina, like many other countries in Latin America, is becoming also a middle-income country in terms of per capita income. And of course, Argentina and Uruguay have had a very strong middle class during all of the 20th century. Uh, and therefore, in that sense, they are much more mature countries than, than we. Now I think those things are beginning a little bit more even. And I think that in the case of Argentina and Chile, or to some extent Brazil, needless to say Uruguay, of course, Colombia emerging very rapidly, all that, those are countries in South America that now benefit from what's going on in China and some other demands of our natural resources. And number two, that means that we are going to have similar problems with these emerging new demands of the middle classes and how we're going to be able to be dealing with that. Other than that, I would say, well, Argentina now has always had, a, a, I would say, a rather different political system from Chile. Ours is a much more ideologically oriented. In Argentina, the fact of Peronism produced a tremendous change in the political landscape that still remains many years after Perón died. And it's a fact, a very important political fact. And therefore, we have to understand that our friends at the other side of the mountain has that kind of political system, and we have to see how are we going to be able to understand to each other and to respect to each other. So I would say that now our relations are good, good relations, no matter that we understand that to have good relations doesn't mean that our government has to have similar ideologies. And this, I think, is very important. Yeah. Okay, I see a number of hands. Uh, Mark, I think yours was the first. Go ahead. Microphone here, please. Thank you. Uh, Mark Schneider, International Crisis Group. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, you spoke eloquently about um, the importance of rules of the game uh, being established and being followed, um, particularly in terms of protecting small countries. Um, if one looks at the rules of the game in the Americas in terms of the democratic system, a decade ago, the Inter-American Democratic Charter was adopted. And since then, we've seen several countries where key elements, like the independence of the judiciary, have come under attack. Uh, if one looks at how do you encourage respect for that, those rules of the game, uh, do you see any way in which in Latin America, the Latin American countries can come together to press for respect for uh, and adherence uh, to the Inter-American Democratic Charter? Obviously Venezuela, Nicaragua, there are several countries where those issues are of great concern. I guess that a good answer may be probably it's necessary that to explain to some other acting presidents that there is life after being president. <laughs> <laughs> probably they don't know, you know. <laughs> this is something that uh, was taught to me by 
former President Betancourt that once told me, you know, I have a good news for you. I was candidate for president. I had a good news for you. There is life after being president. <laughs> and then he had the only problem that first you have to be president. <laughs> <laughs> well, but other than that, I could say that I can understand why presidents say you need more power to do one, two, three, four, you know. Okay. But the question is that we understand also how political institutions should work. And it seems to me that uh, it may be necessary to have a, a stronger institutions in the hemisphere. If now you have the so-called CELAC, this uh, community of uh, Latin American and Caribbean states, well, I think that it would be so important to discuss those issues very openly in the CELAC. Of course, to discuss also in the Organization of American State, but if you say, no, this is something that we discuss among ourselves, okay, let's discuss among ourselves. Now, let me tell you, whenever I say about Latin American states, I try to explain this once to Prime Minister Chrétien, and uh, uh, we, we, of course, we talk with uh, Chrétien in English, and Chrétien <coughs> then turned very rapidly to Spanish, not to French, and say, Monsieur le Président, Je parle français. Je suis latin aussi. <laughs> so if you're going to have a Latin American country, Canada would like to be there as, as a French-speaking country. But other than that, to have inviting to, to Canada, I say that uh, it's important how are we going to be able to address those issues because they're becoming more and more common, you know, particularly the question about the judiciary. And, 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 and the other question to, to be and to say things very bluntly, the question of the press, you know, and how the freedom of press is going to be fulfilled. And here going both ways, you know, because in some cases, the press only represents those that can afford to have a journal. And that's another side of the equation. But anyhow, that's a little bit more difficult to, to address. Thank you, President uh, Lagos. Uh, Johanna Mendelssohn Foreman from CSIS. I was uh, very taken by your words about Democracy 2.0 and some of the implications of social media. And you mentioned uh, the Arab Spring. Chile might have a lot to teach Egyptians, particularly in a military transition. And I was wondering if you personally had had any contact with the new government in Egypt or whether colleagues of yours had been trying to discuss comparative lessons of military transitions which are taking place in another part of the world but bear many similarities to the kinds of issues that you faced in Chile. Thank you. Well, uh, let me tell you personally, unfortunately, I was invited by the United Nations to be part of a mission and because of the agenda I, I couldn't make it. I, I know that uh, some friend of mine that has played an important role in in, in Chile's uh, co the concertation of the political democratic parties, has been involved in Egypt and has been in, 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 in with talk with uh, most of the leaders of uh, the new, the new leaders of uh, Egypt. Now, let me tell you that it's true what you mentioned. How are you going to be dealing with the issue, particularly with the militaries and the importance of militaries in those countries? I can understand how Prime Minister Erdogan in Turkey is becoming such a, a, a figure to, to imitate and the way that he has been able to address the issue of the military establishment, Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the Mundo of Turkey, etc., etc. And let me tell you also that I think that uh, we have been able in Chile, at, at least during my term, you know, I was lucky enough before amending Pinochet's constitution that didn't allow the president to dismiss commanders-in-chief and some other high generals. I was able to do that because they realized that in the modern world, militaries has to be subordinated to those that are entitled of the political will of the, of the people. And therefore, that's part of an institution. Now, how 
are you going to be able to explain them that now is a different game? And to be respected at the world stage, you need to work with democratic credentials. And among other things, that means how are you going to be able to address the issue with the military? And the question is that if you participate in politics, you are welcome to the club. But please, leave the uniform in the barrack. Because if you are going to have the monopoly of the power, then you cannot participate about who is going to be the power. Because that's precisely the reason why you have an army. And when you have an army, all of us agree that they will have the monopoly of the power. But when and how are you use that power? Can never those two decisions can be made by those that has the power. Somebody else make the decision when and how. And the when and how belong to those that are elected by the people. Now, I know it's difficult to explain this decision. I know that every country is different. Whenever my Spanish friends used to give me lessons, I say, yes, I understand. Thank you for the lesson. But let me remind you that uh, you wait till Franco die to make the transition. <laughs> and with the transition, with Franco alive. Uh, so it's a different, you see? That, that kind of thing is different. And, and the fact, you know, that what's going on now is going to be so important that the new political leaders emerging from this election in Cairo, which was extremely important, you know, that they were able to have an election within less than a year, and they finished who are elected. Now you know who are in parliament. Well, as important as what the military are going to say, what the leaders of these new emerging political leaders are going to be able to understand also that in the same way that you have to make a clear distinction, you have the power, well, the when and how belong to the civilians. In a similar way, if you have a direct line with God, whoever is the name of God, well, you are a very powerful person because you have a line with somebody that is above all of us, which is religion. But if religion is going to be the leading force, I think that it's important to make a distinction. That the power here in this world belongs to the citizens, and that leaves the matters of God and religion for those that really are in that area. But I don't think that it's fair to use religion to say, I'm right and you are wrong. I have this direct line, you know. Because, again, this is very much the power of the military. So I would say, in the same way that you try to teach the military, now it's going to be a different game. I would say, how can you tell them that wars of religion. Well, wars of religion was part of European history, and you need about uh, seven or eight years at the Treaty of Westphalia to make sure that the wars of religion are going to be abrogated, you know. And, and, and therefore, I would say that here you have two major powers, those that have the power of the military, those that have the power of religion how those two powers are going to work together in order to build a democratic system. And you are not going to make some minutes of what you can do with the use of power as a military or using religion. C can you make something like that, you know, and, and to make, in order to have a democratic system? And it, it's different of, what we have, because we have not the problems of religion. It was very clear, a distinction, this is religion, but the, the distinction between the state and religion in Chile was before 
Pinochet was established in the Constitution of 1925. Yeah. Hi, I'm Vanessa Jesus Gonzari from American University. I, was ju I just wanted to go back for a moment to what you said about um, how despite outside political forces, it, each country, each society has its own power to, for democracy or to you know, put up with a dictatorship. So I just wanted to go back to that since so many Latin American countries are still, have still very fragile democracies and sometimes seem to hope for somebody to come and rescue them or blame somebody outside also. Uh, and would you mind if I bring this closer for a moment? The recorder? No, it's okay. okay. So you assume that the answer is going to be extremely important. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm afraid that you will be disappointed. <laughs> well, first of all, let me tell you, probably this is the first time in, in the region where we have a all of our governments are elected. Number two, it's true that in the first decade of this century, quite a number, I mean 21st, I mean, quite a number of countries changed government. But when they changed governments, in all those changes were according to the rules of the game. Either the vice president or the president of the Supreme Court or whatever. Even in the case of Argentina, talking about Argentina, I remember in one week they have three, three presidents or something like that but all of them according to the, uh, which is not bad, you know, to, to have the community. After saying this, the questions about democracy is how efficient it's going to be. Democracy has to deliver. Democracy cannot be only a bureaucratic institution by which every four or five years you go to the polls and you make the vote and you forget about. And the question is that if the president is talking, because the president always is the major communicator in any country, in Latin America or in the US. The question is, the president is talking every day about how good the country is because we have a growth rate of five, five, six, seven, eight percent. If people don't realize that that figure, that means nothing for the majority of the people, unless they perceive that the 5% is expressed because now they have a better school, a better primary health care center, a better highway, a better housing allowance or whatever. I mean, that something is improving around him. And this is the major problem with regard to democracy. Are we going to learn how to deliver? Now, in defense of Latin America, I think that now Latin American countries has an important number of people well prepared that know how to run, at least from the economic point of view. More to the right, more to the left, whatever, but that's it. And it's my impression that in the same way that now we have elected governments, now increasingly they know how to run the economy. And we don't have the problem that we used to have in the past. Probably because in the past we have so many crises, we got a PhD in crisis, <laughs> and for the first time we can say, look, this huge crisis that now we have in the world, we are innocent, we have nothing to do with that. <laughs> and which is good, you know. <laughs> but then the, the, the second point is, are we going to learn how to deliver? And probably that's the major issue. Because if you want to strengthen democracy, it's not a question to teach that in, in the schools, which is good to teach that in the schools. But much more important is that you perceive that this is a good system to deliver what are the needs of, of the citizens, those that demand, you know. And this is something that sometimes you don't understand very well. Because there are some areas where the market is not going to fulfill or to deliver. If you want to have drinkable water in rural areas. In the city it's very easy, you just go to because you have the cannon in front of you with fresh water. In rural areas it's quite expensive. In Chile, one, two, up to three thousand dollars to have drinkable water in a rural area per family. So unless you put the money for that, they will not have drinkable water. And if you think that drinkable water is something that has to be fulfilled for everybody. 
is a citizen right, or you will say it's a basic need, or you will say it's a public good. Well, you can provide the public good through the private system, but the question is, are you going to be able to deliver that, or it's just a promise, or something that is written in some paper, in a law? And this is the point. And therefore, in some cases, if you want to deliver, well, it's going to be necessary to do some other things other than the market. Somebody can say, look, democracy at the very end is a system by which you establish what are going to be the public goods that the citizens consider that are public goods. Do you see the point? I need to say that those public goods change. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I give the example there in, a, in the book that I was uh, in the process of uh, cutting the ribbon of a new very good hospital that we deliver. And after the ceremony approached me, somebody that was in the audience and said, Mr. President, I didn't want to interrupt you, but let me tell you, what kind of hospital is this? Here I know that we don't have a scanner. And here you're talking us about this new hospital, and the hospital has no scanner at all. Well, the advantage when you are president that you look down and this a minister something to, to help you, no? And the minister say, Mr. President, the fact that we didn't have a scanner in the hospital because in, in the next town, 50 kilometers from here, there are a scanner. And given the number of people, then it's much cost-benefit analysis to send them 50 kilometers to the scanner in that other hospital. And I said, well, you see, this is the answer. No, sir, I'm so sorry. I wanted to have here, in my town, in my hospital, a scanner. For them, a scanner was a public good. You see what I mean? He thought that because Chile was growing, why don't we have a scanner everywhere? Why don't you have an X-ray everywhere today? But probably 50 years ago, I don't know how many, X-ray was something unusual. You see? And and this is, this is the case. Well, how do you define the public good? And this, I think, is, is important. And, and this has to do with how to strengthen democracy. Yeah. Okay, we were running out of time. At the either, either two very quick ones, because I've seen two hands here, but please uh, make them. And, uh, okay, yeah, okay uh, three of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Please, you had your hand up. Ma'am, right here. Uh, okay, I'm Constable from the Washington Post. Ricardo, it's a pleasure to see you. I'm not sure if I'm the only other person in the room who was there uh, during the plebiscite in 1988, but it was certainly one of the most important experiences of my life. Um, I, I want, I'd ask you to reflect a little bit. Um, you have a unique perspective, both as an international economist and as a moderate socialist leader in Chile for many, many years. I have two questions. One, do you now think that it was necessary for um, the kinds of very harsh uh, 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 economic medicine that was delivered by Pinochet, was it necessary to have that kind of harsh medicine delivered by a dictator in order for Chile uh, to emerge uh, as what it is today? Or was there any other way it could have happened? And number two, more broadly, have your own views as an economist evolved based on your own experiences as the leader of the country? I'd be very interested to see your own evolution of thinking. Thank you. Can we put together the, the questions? Yeah. Should I, should we the question? Okay. I very yeah, if we can combine them, that might be a good idea, because we are getting short on time. We have the books to take. My name's Judd Kessler. I'm a former Foreign Service officer who lived in Chile for five years during the early 70s. I'm a partner in a law firm here in Washington. Um, one of the remarkable things about Chile's transition uh, has to do with the economic thinking. Because when I lived in Chile, uh, the students had pictures of, of uh, Che Guevara and, and uh, uh, the, the Marxist left was, was very much in vogue. And some of the parties within your own coalition uh, certainly held those views, uh, uh, parts of the Socialist Party, of Moscow, uh, Marx, uh, Moscow Line Communist Party. Um, 
And you know, you're kind of either with this or against this. Uh, we say you can't have a, a, a capitalist system or a free market system and uh, that kind of socialism. So how did you work that out? Or could you talk about that within the coalition? And maybe we can fold it in. Yeah. Is, is it related so we can perhaps fold it yeah. in? Why, why don't we fold it in now? Yes, that way we'll save some time. Mr. President, Arturo Contreras from the Inter-American Defense College. Uh, before the first war of Iraq, you have the courage to say no to that war. Uh, we are living a crisis in the Middle East, and Chile depends in 100% of the oil imported from other countries. If you have to advise to the current, the, the current government of Chile, what would be your position in that crisis? We forgot to... The position of Chile uh, about the possibility of a military crisis in the almost... Do you mean with regard to Iran? Is that what you're referring yeah. to? Okay. Oh. Okay, that, that's a lot in one uh, with a yeah. little bit of time left, but we're, your powers of synthesis will really be tested now. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I, I don't think that in order to implement economic reforms, even though they are very, to be very strong, you need to have a dictatorship. Because it seems to me that in a democratic system, you can explain to the people what you have to do. When President Frey decided to close the coal mines in Chile, it was a tremendous effect in, in, in those uh, coal, coal mines uh, uh, towns in Chile, cities that you know. But it was possible for the president to go there and explain why they wanted, and it was necessary from the economy. And this was a, a question of culture for those people. And it's very difficult to do, but it's possible to explain and even today, those towns normally keep voting for concertation, <laughs> which is not very popular, but they keep voting. So I think it's, it's possible. It doesn't justify the thing. With the question of evolution of the thinking, I think that those two questions were related. First, I think that democracy sometimes is like environment. You are not going on in your city when the sky is beautiful and blue. <coughs> How happy I am because I'm living here in a very clean city. To take it for granted, the problem is when the, the air is not clean anymore, then you start complaining. And then you discover how important was the past when your city was so clean, you know. For me, Democracy was for granted. I never thought that I was going to be and to see a dictatorship in Chile. Never. And it seems to me that the first important aspect was, and that's something that has to be still waiting for some historian to write, how much changed Chilean culture because of the exile? What that means to send to exiles 20, 30, 40,000 people, but those 20, 30, 40,000 people are leaders in their own communities. And that is a tremendous change. We were in the middle of Pinochet's dictatorship, 82, 83, and I was invited to a very poor neighborhood in Chile to have a meeting with some socialist people. I arrived to that very small and modest house in the middle of a winter time, a extremely rainy day, I tried to avoid going because it was raining so much, and they say, oh, sir, we are trying to prepare something for you after your talk. And I arrived to a modest house of about uh, 12 people, no more than that. And I arrived to the house, and to my surprise, it was a very modest, extremely modest house, but you had tears, a cuckoo watch, cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> well, then I learned that what they had prepared for me was a raclette. How is that you have a raclette here? This is Swiss, uh, huh? quite sophisticated. The son and daughter were exiled in Switzerland, and the owners of that house, very modest people, has been in Switzerland. They, they never thought that. 
the contact with what's going on abroad is the number two reason. Not only to see democracy working, or not working, if you are going to be in the East European countries, that many of them went to there. And they didn't like it, that you have to ask permission to leave the country to somebody that is your boss. Huh? Number three, with regard to economic thinking, the fact that probably you went very far away with the question of socialization, many things. I remember quite well, early in the 1980s, a discussion about what role should have the banking. Should the banking be still property of the state or should the banking go to the private sector? And I remember when among 10 people, the decision was eight to two to go for the private sector. We, we assumed that our 10 people were making huge definitions in our group, of course, you know. It's very funny to be in those cases. And none of us at that time thought that some, some of us is going to be in a position of power tomorrow. But then the question was, and as another story, when you decided to open up the country. Because before that, when you have a closed country, you have a monopoly. Beer was a monopoly, only one company. Cement, only one company. Steel, only one company. So you were against monopolies. And one way went to socialize everything. But when you open and you discover that then you can drink uh, imported beer, and the imported beer probably was cheaper than the other one. My goodness. Uh, what about then <laughs> free trade? It's not so bad after all. Uh, in, the, in the Chile of the 70s, how many people can afford to, to have a drink of whiskey other than those that uh, have some facilities to import? You remember that? I, mean, I, I didn't, I didn't thought that was possible to, to have whiskey in a normal way. And when you discover that now whiskey probably is cheaper than Pisco, well, <laughs> my goodness, in what world we are living now, you see? So that, that is, is the other way of changing the world, the world, you know. And needless to say then after the building wall, but then I used to say, there are two things and two walls that came down. The Berlin Wall and the other wall is Wall Street in 2008. Because what happened with Lehman Brothers is something to think about. But that I would say with regard to the evolution of uh, thinking. And with regard to the question of Iran, to conclude, I, I think that uh, it's extremely difficult to, to have some advice, if it's possible to say that when you have no all the elements. Let me tell you that with regard to Iraq, at least, I remember once talking with Chirac, and Chirac telling to me, look, Mr. President, I can tell you 100% that there is no atomic weapons in Iraq. And my intelligent people say that they have not found weapons of mass destruction, but I cannot tell you 100% that there are no weapons of mass destruction. Well, what are the real points with regard to this issue? Unless you are in power, it's going to be very difficult from the outside to say, look, I think that a preventive a responsibility to protect means that some kind of prevention has to be made before. Or this is going to be extremely dangerous and therefore the responsibility to protect shouldn't go so far. Uh, I, guess, I, I, I guess that you have to be very careful what that means, and if you're going to be able to do that. And all of us know that in the past, it has been done that thing, and some facilities were destroyed, and the people in Iran decided not to tell anybody that they had been wounded in such a way. But in, in this case, I think that uh, I have been told that probably the kind of uh, economic sanctions being applied today by United States and Europe are so strong that if you can put similar pressure on Japan and China, then they will go to the negotiation table. The question is, are you going to be able to put that pressure in those other two? Or are you in a position to say, look, if you, if you don't do that, then I will have to take some other means, and you are going to be responsible, not me. But, I mean, there are many uh, ways of how do you want to handle that? 
very hot potatoes. But I think that the war in Iraq probably will be of some important lesson for that. You know. yeah. President Lagos, Ambassador Kelly, thank you very, very much. Now, uh, you've got a chance to get your books signed and to buy a book if you haven't uh, previously done so. And I invite you to go over to the, the table. Um, one thing I should tell you is that uh, both cash and credit card are accepted. Uh, President Lagos will sign uh, with a pen for those who pay in cash and use a rubber stamp for those who pay with credit card.